Hi again, it's Jason from Fraser Valley Rose Farm, and today I want to talk to you about a special group of roses. These are the uncommon, rare, historic roses. Garden-worthy roses in their own right, but they're in trouble because they're not widely distributed in the industry anymore. They've dropped out of the trade and therefore becoming harder to find and are uh, at risk of extinction in the hobby. So. I had struggled with how I wanted to bring this topic up to the audience here because I don't want to come across as overly negative about anything in the hobby. I don't want to discourage anybody. However, this is an issue of talking straight with you about the prospects of roses, uh, at least in my market, in Canada, in the United States. Uh, something has happened that has made these roses at risk and so I want to discuss that with you today. Given that this is a video essay of sorts, I'm going to break the whole subject up into five topic statements that I'll address at some length in the body of the video. The first of those is that the industry has changed, leaving uncommon roses at risk. The second topic I'll discuss is that these changes are cultural and demographic, and they're unlikely to reverse all on their own. The third one is that the rose clubs or garden clubs and societies are poorly positioned to help with this issue. The fourth one is that we can't count on the industry to rescue us from the problem. And finally, number five, so I can sound at least slightly optimistic, is that leaves it up to you and me to fix the problem with the industry and to preserve these garden-worthy roses for the hobby, for us, and for the future. The fact that the rose business has changed over time, well, that's uncontroversial and really inevitable. Every business is going to change over time. The big difference in the rose industry is that it went through such a mania in the 20th century. It was the uh, golden age of the high octane hybrid tea rose and their demand for roses was extremely high. The bare root roses were produced in the millions per year in California and Arizona and Texas and then shipped out to customers. This made demand for all of the roses very, very high and there were lots of businesses serving every part of the market, including the uncommon roses, the historical roses. There were a lot of suppliers in that business too. I'll go into that in just a second. But speaking of the rose industry, as a whole, I want to send you off-site to do a little bit of homework watching uh, another video here. I'm going to link it below. This is Bill DeVore, a guy who knows the industry uh, better than anybody, and he's out of Southern California. He made a presentation for the American Rose Society talking about the future of the rose industry. Uh, nice, nice topic for this. Uh, the part I want you to watch is in the timestamp between 1209 and 1413, and again, I'll link that below the video. Uh, it's just about a two-minute section that explains a lot of what you need to know about what happened to the rose industry in the latter half of the 20th century and specifically between 1985 and say 2010 or so. Um, now this kind of dovetails with my own entry into the industry around 20, 2005, 2010. I was coming around to roses. I was enjoying them. I was entering the hobby. And like many people who come into the hobby, you start by going through the old rose books and dog-earing the, the corners of pages of roses that you want to go look for. Uh, and then when I went to go look for them, suddenly the supply was dwindling. Uh, Jackson and Perkins, as a supplier, basically went bankrupt in 2010 uh, due to lower demand. They couldn't sell their roses and, uh, and they went out of business. Uh, it's just one supplier, but here in Canada, as an example, there was a very large bare root supplier that had, I think, 450 uh, historic roses or a, a, an assortment of 450 roses. Uh, this was Pickering Nurseries. And in 2015, due to market changes and supply changes, they dropped out of the business. Simultaneously, there was another supplier nearby there, Hortico, uh, which reduced its assortment dramatically, leaving in Canada here a, a real uh, concentration, I think it's down to one major mail, mail order supplier in Canada today that provides even some semblance of a large assortment, and that's Palatine Roses. And they're doing a good job in holding the torch for the rest of us, but it really does leave us in a precarious position for the industry. Uh, now the hobby has uh, thousands, you know, tens of thousands of varieties that have been introduced over the years. And by the years, I mean going back 300 years years for roses. It's that long-lived a portion of the horticultural business. And some of those, like I'm going to name some here, Paul Neron. 
a wonderful hybrid perpetual uh, that I think is worthwhile growing in your garden, even if it is a little susceptible to black spot. Uh, Buff Beauty, uh, uh, Duchess of Portland, Sophie's Perpetual. I mean, I could start naming roses that are in my garden, but I snapped them up from some of these suppliers uh, just as they were going out of business. And then when I went back the following year, those guys were gone and I couldn't get the next group that I wanted. So these are roses that have been orphaned by the trade. Uh, no longer because of the contraction and the size of the business, no longer is it financially viable, at least here in Canada, for uh, these to be offered to the public. So um, let's talk about the demographic changes that caused all of that. It's no coincidence that the boom of the rose uh, came along with the flight to the suburbs and the big expansion in suburban areas. As things changed further, people started moving into apartments and condos and places where they didn't have quite so much access to gardening space. Uh, so that's one shift, just a lack of space. The other thing that changed was the ethos of the gardener. Uh, as Bill DeVore mentioned in that video section I, was, uh, I had referred you to, uh, we've spent the last hundred years scaring the hell out of people about what it means to grow a rose. And so we've taught them that it's a demanding plant, that it has to be grown in its own garden, it has to have special conditions, full sun, uh, you've got to prune it, you've got to sp spray the pesticides, you've got to fertilize it heavily, water, you've got to be standing there tending to this dedicated rose garden and that's the only way you're going to feel successful. We've also placed some status and judgment into that and I think that's the cultural baggage that roses bring with them. A little bit of the idea of affluence and privilege and status seeking that kind of sticks in the craw of people these days. I noticed in general that the trend in gardening is more towards uh, food and edibles and uh, what people would call practical plants. Now this doesn't fit the story of the rose although the rose actually is wonderful at all of these things. The rose is a heavily flowering plant. It, uh, it actually interacts well with other plants in the garden providing uh, forage for bees and other insects. Uh, as long as you don't turn it into uh, the wrong kind of thing, the, the dedicated rose garden, the formal rose garden, uh, the rose fits into the garden beautifully, but we haven't been telling that story for a long, long time. So the rose came away with all this cultural baggage and I think people all at once started to reject that, that story of the dedicated rose garden and the formal rose garden and the idea that they should be seeking status by having a beautifully maintained garden rather than having something a little less formal and a little less work but also a little more productive in the way of food gardens. Roses didn't make that pivot well. I don't think that those demographic changes are going to reverse anytime soon. The only chance we have against that as rose hobbyists is to change the story about what roses are. Roses haven't changed. We were just telling the wrong story about them. They are a tough, high performing shrub. Yes, if you treat them better, they will perform better. Uh, but I think that's true of every kind of a garden plant from veggies all the way up to, to trees. So we got to start telling a different story about this, but I don't think those cultural changes are going to reverse themselves. So uh, we've got to take action to preserve these roses. Third topic here is actually a question. Can't we then just count on the garden clubs and rose societies to coordinate the efforts to preserve these garden-worthy roses? And my answer is uh, maybe not so much. These organizations are made up of wonderful, well-intentioned people who really do care about the hobby. So that checks all the boxes. The, problem is that they're facing struggles all of their own and a lot of them are the same demographic struggles. Uh, they are built on the model of in-person meetings and a certain amount of formality uh, and that is not resonating with the public very well right now. I've seen garden club attendance uh, diminishing dramatically except in some some rare exceptions and I've made a whole separate side rant. You don't have to watch this one but I've made a side rant I'll link up above here. It's called Why Garden Clubs Are Failing in a slightly different format. I did in a live format format instead of a topic format like this. So it came out a little weird, but it does discuss the topic at some length. Um, 
so the point of, of this is, yeah, I think I love the way you're thinking. I think these guys can be really helpful and, and hopefully they can play a key role in preserving the, uh, the roses, uh, but they've got some challenges of their own to deal with before they can attack this in any coordinated way. And I wish them the best, but uh, I don't think we can count on them to save us. Well then, what about the industry? Surely it is in the best interest of the horticulture business to preserve uncommon varieties of plants and keep them for posterity. Actually, no, uh, that's not true. They have financial interests and I'm not putting that down, but they have employees, they have uh, big properties, uh, greenhouses, lots of capital invested. They have suppliers, they have customers, uh, they have a whole industry uh, and financial goals to answer to. So on an individual basis, you may ask uh, any horticulturist, wouldn't it be better to preserve these plants in the trade and keep them around? And they'll say yes. Uh, but they're not going to make financial decisions on that basis. The thing is that carrying uh, a thousand different varieties that you sell one of every year or ten of every year uh, is far more expensive than selling a single variety that you sell ten thousand of in a year. It just makes more financial sense to focus your efforts on crops that can be grown uniformly, that don't have to be maintained separately, different stock plants, all of that expense gets built into their business and they don't want to take it on. So you can't count on the industry to solve this one for you. You just can't. There are, in fact, some suppliers that produce these things on smaller scales. So if anything, our industry partners are small to medium sized specialty nurseries that can help us to preserve these roses. That leads me to my final point is that it, it's up to you and me to decide whether we want to preserve these old garden roses, these garden worthy roses that have fallen out of the trade. Now you don't have to, this is optional. It certainly you can come into the rose hobby and you can buy the current assortment from David Austin or Weeks or Star Roses, generally made up of things that they've introduced in the last 20 years and that will serve their financial interest quite nicely. Uh, and you know, you'll fill up your garden with some nice roses, uh, but if you are, if you do take a special interest in those roses that have special attributes, uh, the ramblers, uh, the, the old climbers, the old tea roses, the spinosissima roses, those are the Scots roses, uh, anything, uh, the hybrid perpetuals, anything from the history of roses or anything within even in the 20th century that started to fall out of the trade. If those uh, catch your interest in any way, what I implore you to do is start looking up who are your suppliers locally and start adding them to your collection. Who knows how long those suppliers will last. Here in Canada, of course, uh, I missed the boat on Pickering, but I'm still buying from Palatine, I'm buying from Cornhill, I'm trying to buy from all of the other suppliers and collect from the local hobbyists and add them to my stock field here so I can continue to propagate with them. Uh, down in the States, you're slightly more lucky. You have heirloom roses, you have uh, Rogue Valley roses, high country roses. Uh, so you have a, a few different good options that ha still have wide assortments of the uncommon roses available. Available. And I'd say don't take it for granted. These are you want to support these businesses, but you also want to get these plants into your garden. And then the next step, and you know, this is the one I'm gonna ask, this is my advocacy here, is I need you to start learning how to propagate roses. If you want to take an active role in this, I don't care where you learn it from, you can learn it from my videos, you can learn it from Mike Kincaid's videos. I don't care as long as you find a technique that works for you and you start propagating these roses and sharing them amongst other hobbyists. By sharing I don't necessarily mean you don't sell them. That's fine too. I'm making a business of it that way. But what I mean is you're getting them in the hands of other growers. What is the list? What is the final list of garden worthy roses that should be grown in any region? Well, obviously that's going to vary quite a lot from place to place in the world. It's going to be different in Alberta, in Canada, than it would be in New Zealand. So I'm gonna leave that to you to decide uh, which classes of roses you take a special interest in and which kinds of roses are worth preserving in your climate. Uh, but this is, this is the whole point of this, is to get you thinking in that manner of how do we keep those roses for future generations. Uh, the, the breeding work of 3,000 years of, of, uh, of keeping and cultivating roses in human civilization, I, I'd like to keep those around. All right, if you have any questions or comments on this topic or any other topic related to roses, please drop those down into the comments below the video, and thank you so much for watching.